we hope and pray that God is blessing your day. Uh, it's getting close to Christmas and hope and pray you're getting together with family and loved ones. Uh, hopefully this Lord's Day, we're just remembering the most amazing gift ever given, which was Jesus. <coughs> Unto us a child is born, and then 33 years later, unto us a son is given. If you have your Bibles, we're in 1 Corinthians looking at how to live for Jesus. Last week, we just introduced the book in the first three verses where uh, he tells us who's writing, who he's writing to, and he encourages them to have grace and peace, <coughs> me, which Paul does in each of his letters. But today we're going to begin his section about first Thanksgiving, and then he's going to get into the problem. But first, he wants to pray a prayer of thanksgiving. So it would do us well to join in with his same attitude and action. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dearest, loving, heavenly Father, thank you so much for blessing us with good health, with good friends, with family in Christ, especially with the gift of your son and the grace he offers. Father, help us to live for you each day. Help us to live in a way that people who want to get close to you will want to be closer to us because they can see that that will help them get closer to you. Help us learn from what these brothers did right in Corinth and from what they did wrong. In your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> like I said, Paul, after introducing his letter in the first three verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he begins with a prayer of thanksgiving. And of all the prayers in your Bible, the most common aspect of prayer is praise and then thanksgiving. Uh, if someone gives you a pie, you thank them for it. If it's a good pie, you praise them for being a good pie maker. Well, that's what we do here. So he's going to praise God and thank God for what he has done in the lives of the Corinthians. And I like the way he does it. Look at, let's look at his prayer, starting in verse 4. Okay, he says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm thanking God first because he gave you grace. Well, <clears throat> I mean, what about all their outreach and what about all their accomplishments? And uh-uh. He thanks God for the grace because anything in you that's good, it came from God. Okay, all of our righteous deeds, Isaiah 64, verse 6, are, are, are filthy rags. We don't deserve anything good, correct? And so he says, I'm thanking God first because God gave you grace. And then he goes on, verse 5, he says, I, I, grace in Christ Jesus, that in every way, you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. Okay, <clears throat> They're, what they've been able to speak, it's not because they were such good speakers. What they understand, it's not because they were so good at learning stuff. God's grace gave them the ability to speak and open the doors for them. And it was God's grace that gave them the knowledge that they had. Okay, the, the gospel we preach was a hidden gospel that has now been revealed, and it was revealed by God's grace and by his spirit. And so he's thanking God for what God is doing in these people. We would do well to do the same. When you pray, does your prayer list ask God for a bunch of stuff? Or do you do like they do and start out just thanking God and praising God for what he's done and how well he's done it? Okay, that's, that's the way they prayed. And I think we would be enriched and the purpose of God would be advanced if we would learn to pray like this. Amen? Okay, let's go on. He says in verse six, he says, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, <clears throat> we are short on testimony. Now, Testimony was not designed for the service uh, for the uh, church service. In fact, it's specifically stated that way in, for, in chapter 14. But the idea is testimony is how we call people to Jesus. Your testimony. See, the story of Jesus is just a history lesson without your testimony. It's just what did, what did Jesus do 2,000 years ago? Well, that's nice. What's he doing today? That's your testimony. 
And your testimony is not how rotten you used to be before you were a Christian. And your testimony is not how good you are now that you are a Christian. Your testimony is how amazing Jesus is and what he has accomplished in your life. It's the work of Christ, not the work of you, not the work of me. It's the work of Christ. And so he says, your testimony, your testimony about Christ was confirmed. How does your testimony get confirmed? Well, it, it, it bears fruit. And your, your testimony is true. In other words, when you share a story about Christ, it better be true. Because if it's not, it's not testimony. Testimony is telling people how amazing Christ is. What he has done that's amazing. And so when it's true and it's confirmed, that's great. And theirs was confirmed, not, <clears throat> not just by the factual nature, but by the outreach. So many people were brought to Christ. Estimated up to 30,000 Christians by the end of the first century in Corinth. Great church, doing great things. And by the way, they didn't have any church buildings. They met in homes and small groups. There were no church buildings for 300 years, 330 uh, years. <clears throat> so he says, uh, your testimony is confirmed, verse 7, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, y'all aren't lacking any spiritual gifts. Now, if you remember back in Acts uh, 6, the apostles laid hands on seven men. We call them seven deacons, servants, appointed servants in the church. And these men were able to then do great miracles and wonders. Philip is one of them. And in Acts 8, he goes to Samaria and preaches and does wonderful miracles. And a bunch of those people are brought to Christ, verse 12 and 13. And when they do, it says that the church in Jerusalem, when they heard that Samaria had received the gospel, they sent Peter and John up there. Well, why Peter and John? Because it tells us in, in verse 16 and 8 through 18 that it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the gift was, the gift was given. See, the gift was given to Philip in Acts 6 by the laying on of the apostles' hands. And here it specifically states that Simon saw that the gift was given by the laying on the apostles' hands. And so now Paul, being an apostle, could do that very thing in Corinth and did. Uh, <clears throat> in Romans 1.11, he hoped and prayed that he could be there with the church in Rome to impart to them some spiritual gifts. Well, here in Corinth, he's done that. We know from uh, uh, First Corinthians, excuse me, Acts chapter 18, that he spent a year and a half in Corinth. And so during that time, He's laid hands on a lot of people. And some of those people, we're going to find out when we get to chapters 12 through 14, they decided to abuse the spiritual gifts that they were given by the laying on the apostles' hands. But here it says in verse 6, uh, verse 7, excuse me, that they were not lacking in any spiritual gift. They had, all, they had tongue speakers, they had healers, they had all these people that had different gift of prophecy, these different gifts that he mentions later on in chapters 12 through 14. So he says, uh, they were waiting for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, <clears throat> we're still waiting for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. No, this is not about the destruction of Jerusalem. That was in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21. That was to the Jews. Okay, this is in a different continent. It's not in Israel. It's clear up in Greece. It's not in Asia, it's in Europe. And they're not Jews, they're Gentiles. Primarily Gentiles that he reaches with the gospel. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. So when he talked about his coming here, this is not his coming in AD 70 against Jerusalem. This is another one. Let's continue. Uh, verse eight, it says, uh, the, the reading of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> See, Jesus doesn't just save you. He sustains you. See, when I was born in Christ, all my sins were washed away. But he continues to keep us saved. We like Romans 5, verses 6 through 8, where it says, Scarcely for a righteous man 
yet would none die. Yet perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us. And while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. But we stop at verse 8. We need to read verses 9, 10, and 11. Because three times it says much more than, much more than, more than. He, if he could save you and get rid of that big pile of sins when you were born in Christ by his death, don't you think he can keep you saved by his life? That's the sustaining we're talking about here. Christ sustains you by his grace. Do you know that? See, we walk around like question marks. Oh, I don't know. I, I hope I've done enough. You have not done enough. Neither have I. No one has done enough except Jesus. We all, all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. We can't get ourselves saved. If you could save yourself, what's Galatians 2.21 say? He says, I don't frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness came by keeping the law, Christ died needlessly. God forbid. No. You can't save yourself. If you could, Jesus would not have had to die. He had to die because you couldn't save yourself and I couldn't save myself. <clears throat> and so he saved us and he sustains us. Okay, he'll sustain you to the end guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Guiltless, no guilt, because he took on the guilt, right? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Him who knew no sin became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Okay? So he goes on then, verse 9. He says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay? God's faithful. If he tells you something, is he going to stay true to it? If he says, I'm coming back, is he coming back? Okay? Everything he said, God's faithful. He's going to keep his word. Okay? <clears throat> he says, uh, God is faithful who called you into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay? <clears throat> God's faithful. He is not going to go back and renege on his word. It's impossible for God to lie. And so if he said he's coming back, he's coming back. If he says he's taking us home, he's taking us home. If he said he's going to go and prepare a place for us, he went to prepare a place for us. I think he did that at the cross, and that's where he went to prepare it, but that's another story. <clears throat> so his prayer of praise and thanksgiving is how he starts off the letter. After the introduction, the first three verses, it's all praying and thanking God. It's not praying and asking God for stuff. Our prayer list tends to be, Lord, bless my house, bless my friends, bless my family, bless my health, bless their health, my friend's health, my family's health. For Jesus' sake, amen. That's not for Jesus' sake. That's for your sake. That's for my sake. No, he praises God for what God's done, what God's accomplished in their life, because it's spiritual and eternal primarily. Yes, physical things get prayed for in the Bible, but primarily it's spiritual. Why? Because that which is seen is temporal. That which is unseen is eternal. He's going to tell us that in chapter in, in the second letter, in chapter 4, verse 18. But here, <clears throat> he gives them this prayer of praise and thanksgiving in verses 4 down through verse 9. All right? That's kind of a quick <clears throat> prayer time for Paul. Because he has to get to the problem. Someone has basically given him information about the church in Corinth that there's a big problem there. Let's take a look at it, starting in verse 10. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Okay, if you didn't even read the rest of the paragraph, what do you know already? There's a problem in the church in Corinth. What's the problem? The problem's disunity. You know it's disunity because he's praying for them to have unity. He's praying for them to have, uh, I am, I'm appealing to you that you agree that there be no divisions among you, okay? That you be united, okay? <clears throat> His call for them. 
It, he says, I want you to be one. What was Jesus' prayer in John 17? Six times, I pray that you be united, that you be perfected in unity, that you be one, so the world will know that you said, I mean, all that stuff he prayed for before he went to the cross, that's what he wants. He wants us to be one. He wants to be united. Your opinion on any subject should take a backseat to the unity of the body of Christ. If you think your opinion is so important that you need to split the church, you are sinning. Don't do that. It's the body of Christ, the unity of the body of Christ. So just from the very first verse, verse 10 here, you know that they've got a problem with this unity. And then he's going to tell us in verse 11, he says, for it has been reported to me by Chloe's people, by the people who are with Chloe. Basically, they had a house church. And the people that met with Chloe, some of them came to Paul and told him what the problem was in the church in Corinth. And so some of Chloe's people, that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. Okay, you guys are fighting with each other. Okay, <clears throat> I grew up, I have one older brother, one older sister, and two little brothers. There was quarreling between brothers. And mom would set us down on chairs, folding chairs, and, and open up our, we would open up our Bibles and we would read 1 John chapter 4, last three verses. If you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love God whom you have not seen? Okay? And we had to learn to love each other. We had to hug each other because she didn't want her kids to be fighting with each other. God doesn't want his kids to be fighting with each other. He says, I heard there's quarreling among you. They squealed on you. You're messing up. Quit it. And that's what he's going to have to deal with a lot in this lesson. Now, I love the way he does it. Look at the next verse, verse 12. He says, what I mean is that each of you says, well, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. Okay. Hopefully we all follow Christ. But when you say, I follow Christ, in contrast to you following something else, yeah, be careful how you do that. <clears throat> I want to follow Christ with you. I want to follow Christ ahead of you. See, if you work out, the goal is not to just have this one arm get really strong. You want your whole body to be healthy. God wants his whole body to be healthy. You're not in competition with the other arm, okay? You, you're supposed to all seek to build up the body. And your goal is not to build you up. Your goal is to build them up. As we go on through the letter, we're going to find out, well, like this, like in Hebrews, your goal when you go to, when you get together with the church on the Lord's Day, never does it say you go to church so you can be built up. Never tells you to go to church so you can be built up. It says you go get together with your brothers and sisters so you can build them up. Now, if you do that, you get built up. But the goal is not for you to build, be built up. The goal is for you to build them up because that's how you get built up and how they get built up and how the body as a whole gets built up, which is what God wants. That's what we want. That's what Paul wants in this letter. And he's heard from Chloe's people, there's a problem. Well, I'm, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas. I'm, no. Now, we're going to find out later when you get to chapter 4, verse 6, it wasn't Paul. It wasn't Apollos. Paul says, I'm applying this to me and to Apollos just so that I don't make you guys look bad. Okay. Let's say they had some scoundrel uh, in the church there that was uh, a diotrephes like uh, in 3 John. Okay. Who loved to have the preeminence among them, the guy in Ephesus. Well, if they get a guy like that in Corinth, Paul could have called him out by name. That would have been asking for trouble. And so Paul says, instead of calling him out by name and the other guy who's also being divisive, calling him out by name, instead of calling him out by name, I, I'm, I'm going to put it on us. Put it on me. Put it on Apollos. Put it on Peter. Okay? We'll take the heat. It's three of you guys over there. 
you guys are dividing up the body of Christ, but I'm not going to point you out my name because I want you to humble yourselves before God. So in chapter four, verse six, he says, no, the, it wasn't, it wasn't Paul. It wasn't Apollos. It was you guys. And I'm not going to say your name because I don't want you to be remembered through all eternity for being the scoundrels that messed up the church in Corinth. So he doesn't. I think that's great. So he says, uh, verse uh, 12, he says, now, what I mean is when you say, I follow Paul's, I, I Paul, I Cephas, I follow Christ, you're choosing loyalties. Don't do that. There's one body and we're all supposed to be part of it. Well, <clears throat> they, they, they don't teach what we teach. Well, they're wrong. So are you. So am I. We're all wrong. The only one who's right is Jesus because he himself is our doctrine. Okay? There's things you can do and that you know about Jesus that I don't know. I want to learn them. If you can share that with me to help me walk closer to God, I want it. And if there's something I can share with you that'll help you grow closer to God, I pray that you want it. And we're all growing together towards God. Yes, I fall short. Yes, you fall short. But we can all grow together. Not this loyalty, well, I follow Apollos, I follow Cephas, I follow Paul, I follow... No. We're all generic Christians. I'm a Christ follower. Hopefully you're a Christ follower. All of us. Okay. So let's go on. Verse 13. Is Christ divided? Now, what he does here, he learned a lesson from Jesus. When Jesus found a group of people or individuals who didn't understand what they needed to understand, instead of telling them what they needed to know, he would ask them questions that would call them to change their own thinking. Well, that's what Paul is doing here in verse 13. He says, is Christ divided? Rhetorical question. No, Christ is not divided. There's one body and one head of the body. So no, he's not divided. Still in verse 13, he said, was Paul crucified for you? Well, no, Paul wasn't crucified for you. He says, then Paul wasn't, Apollos wasn't, Cephas wasn't. Don't you choose these loyalties? Now, again, it's not Paul, it's not Apollos. It's probably not Cephas. It is some people there that we're going to find out later in 2 Corinthians that consider themselves super apostles, okay? And Paul has to, calls, Paul's going to call them on the carpet, but we, we have a while before we get there. But he says, was Christ crucified for you? No. I mean, were these guys crucified? These guys were not crucified for you. Paul wasn't crucified for you. I wasn't crucified for you. Okay, so he goes on. He says, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Now, Paul's laying all this on himself. But again, chapter four, verse six, the real scoundrels are people in that congregation who are doing it to call, to get authority for themselves. Paul said, no, you weren't baptized in the name of Paul and you weren't baptized in the name of any of these other guys either. Okay, do you know what kind of Christian I am? I'm just Christian. I'm just Christ follower. Somebody asked me one time, you a minister? Yeah, Jack Hayes. Well, what religion are you? I said, I'm a Christian. I said, well, what, what, what kind of a Christian? I said, mostly I'm a happy Christian. Okay, I, I just, I don't want to be name brand. So he goes on. <clears throat> Let's see, verse... 14, he said, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Okay, <clears throat> now, people like to take this verse and say, <clears throat> you'll notice here that baptism is not important because God didn't send Paul to baptize. No, Paul sent, God sent Paul to teach, not to baptize. <clears throat> uh, uh, last October, 13 months ago, uh, I was over in Uganda. We baptized 62 people one day. And of the 62, I baptized two of them. The other 60 were baptized by Henry and uh, Onyongo, Onyongo Benad. Okay. And they were the ones that baptized them. God didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to teach. 
And if I hadn't taught, we wouldn't have had 62 people wanting to be baptized. Okay? So Paul says he didn't send me to baptize. Paul is not saying that baptism is not important because Jesus said, verily, verily, as in amen, amen. I say unto you, unless a man is born of water and the spirit, he shall in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. And for those of you who have been taught that born of water is talking about physical birth, it is a lie. There is not one single doctor, not one single document that we know of that in Koine Greek, the, the, the Greek that the New Testament is written in, not one document mentioning born of water as anything other than baptism. Physical birth was never called born of water. If you go to John 1 verse 13, you find out that physical birth was called born of blood. So when Jesus said you need to be born of water and the spirit, he meant it. Okay? That's how you get in the kingdom of heaven. So Paul's not saying baptism is not important. He's saying my job is to do the teaching. I don't care who does the dunking. I'll do the teaching. You get somebody else to dunk you. I need to teach you. So he goes on. Uh, I baptize none of you except Christmas and Gaius. Now, he's going to oops and mess up on one of the family, household of Stephanus. He forgot about them, but we'll get to them. He says, so that none of you may say that you are baptized in my name. See, when I go over as a missionary and I talk to those people, I don't want them to be able to say, oh, I got baptized by the American missionary. No, I don't want their faith to be in me. I want their faith to be in Jesus. So it's better for them if I don't baptize them. I want some, I want one of their people to baptize them so that they don't have this misplaced loyalty to an American. I want them to have their faith in Christ. And so Paul says, I'm glad I didn't do the baptize, that other people did it. Let's see, go on. He says, now, I, I, by the way, verse 16, oops, I forgot. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus, but beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anyone else. <laughs> okay, oops, I forgot. Paul, was, Paul wasn't a good record keeper. He didn't have the list that he sent into uh, Firm Foundation told how many people he baptized. No, he just... He just uh, just taught him and let God take care of it. He says, verse 17, he says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of his power. He's going to go on later on in chapter 2 and say, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 2 verse 2. He says, it's not about eloquent words. It's about Jesus. What I want to do is convince you that Jesus is so amazing that you are willing to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him wherever he would lead you. That's what I want. That's what he wants. That's what he asked people to do. That's what he told people to do. In Mark, Mark 8, verse 34, Matthew 16, verse 24, and Luke 9, verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In Luke, he added the word daily. <clears throat> but the thought is, it's about us surrendering our lives to Christ. And so Paul says, I'm not sent to baptize. I'm sent to preach. The gospel will have its effect. And when you find that, when, when Philip preached Christ to the Ethiopian in Acts 8, the, the Ethiopian said, hey, here's water. What hinders me to be baptized? Okay, I want to teach Christ in a way that people want to surrender their lives to him. Yes, baptism is wet and messy and humbling. But God chose wet and messy and humbling. That's what happens. Romans 6, 3 and 4. 1 Peter three twenty one, And a whole bunch of others. I want you to be one body in Christ. He wants all of us to be one body in Christ. He especially here wants the church in Corinth to be one body in Christ. And he's going to get some more. He's going to spend a lot of time in this letter dealing with that. But that'll have to wait till next week. May God richly bless you and Jesus give you peace in your believing.